Seems as though no sooner than we began, here we are at the completion of the retreat. <laughs> Except we've been on quite a journey together, and I know you've been on some journeys yourselves in the heart, deep inside, and uh, in a sense we can say that the retreat is ending, but in another sense it continues on. It's almost as though once you started on this path, it keeps on pulling you in, in beautiful ways. And you have the seed of a little tender plant in your heart. It's like a really soft little, maybe green and slightly furry little plant that's growing through the practice of this loving kindness and the practice you've done before you came here too. And, uh, or you can see that little thing as a cute little bird <laughs> that's just nestled there in your heart and really our job now is to protect it to care for it to nurture it and to continue to give it nourishment so that it stays um, alive and it's not going to die the worst case is it maybe doesn't grow but ideally we want to keep it tender we want to keep it nurtured so that it grows even in your daily life. And your daily life is a very rich field for practice. So today I wanted to talk about five things that might help you to keep this little bird alive or keep this little shoot green and growing in your heart. And they are basically the practice of virtue, which we began this retreat with. Uh, you all took the five or even the eight precepts. And hopefully some of you will be able to continue with the five. Remember these are trainings. So it's not that if you um, don't fulfill them all all the time that you're not keeping them. You're still keeping them. You're just training to strengthen them. So mistakes are part of the path. So hopefully you'll continue with that practice. And the next thing is um, patience which is an aspect of that virtue and we very much need when we encounter people who've not been in retreat and who might be um, triggers for some of the more afflictive emotions that can arise. And then harmony, because we need places that we can be and get support and offer our own support too as well. And then wise association, which is part of this. And of course, how we can apply what we've learned here in our daily lives. So we've spoken a bit about that already, but I'll just recap on some of the ways you can use meta practice in your practice, in your daily life. So the retreat situation is very precious, very special, very unusual and fortunate to come by. And it offers a particularly wonderful opportunity to place extra emphasis on the last three factors of the path. Of course, all of them to some extent, but here you have an opportunity to practice right endeavor, which is my preferred translation compared to effort. Of course, this is also possible in daily life, and that often takes the form of sense restraint or guarding the senses as part of the gradual training. It's almost synonymous with right endeavor. But here we've been actively cultivating wholesome states of mind internally, through the sitting practice. And this is a very special opportunity because your mindfulness is simultaneously increasing to be able to help you discern what is wholesome from what is not and how the wholesome gets cultivated. It's not only a matter of using force, it's a matter of a lot of wisdom and discernment and actually gently cultivating the wholesome states at the times that it's possible to do that. And at other times, the emphasis may be on keeping the unwholesome at bay, or even trying to diminish the unwholesome things that are arising in the mind by the use of antidotes, etc. And of course, here we have an opportunity to practice right samadhi, and for that we do need a quiet enough place. Nowhere will be perfect. In Buddhist countries we can go to wonderful temples, the Shwedagon Pagoda is a powerhouse of good energy and strong Dhamma vibrations, <laughs> in the uh, words of my first teacher. But there is a kind of tangible sense of practice energy there. But it's anything but quiet. It's anything but quiet. 
But because of the practice that happens there, whether it's actively chanting or just people talking and relaxing in little corners of all the various shrines and temples, it's basically on this big marble plateau above Yangon with um, four staircases, really long staircases going up to the top and there's this huge um, platform that you can circumambulate. But around that platform are so many places to meditate and quite often I used to meditate there just on marble floors, cold, not that cold, not cold enough really, given the heat, but very, very hard. And there'd be a lot of kind of bells and talking and chanting going on in the background, but you felt you were above the city, above the chaos, and somehow we would learn to make a little bubble around ourselves so that by softening into the atmosphere, by allowing myself to feel held, even the marble floor seemed to disappear and become very soft under the bony ankles. And everything would kind of fade into the background, and yet there'd be this sense of being held. So even in noisy places, sometimes we can practice. We can imagine almost that there's this bubble of goodness around us that surrounds us. And we can let go a little bit into that just accepting those um, inputs at the senses and seeing how we're reacting because you'll never find the perfect place. But you do have your own places, your own homes, rooms, even if they're shared. And it's advisable to make a little corner in your room if you can't have a separate room just for this, maybe even a shed or an outbuilding somewhere that you use just for the purpose of your meditation so that you can continue to develop calm states of mind. But it's important also to be realistic and realize that you're not going to be getting the results every day. And a lot of the time, I remember when I was doing my degree after probably 10 years living in Asia and I came back to England for the first time and uh, I was in a house in London, it was quite quiet. But uh, because I had to think and use my brain so much, there were very few meditations where there wasn't a bit of mental scramble and clutter. And it didn't bother me at all because I understood that the purpose of sitting was to understand my mind and to just sometimes allow the mind to process whatever you've put in. This poor mind can't only be receiving all the time. Sometimes it needs to just let it out, let it flow out. And so I didn't block it at all, I would just sit and notice that at the end of a sitting, even if I was judging it as peaceful or not peaceful, there would always be a measure more calm compared to at the beginning. And one of the things we've done here is actually check out our state of mind at the end of a sit. And it's not to give it evaluation, it's to notice that almost all of the time you'll find some kind of softening or some little bit more peace, a little bit more stability or groundedness. If you've been processing um, quite an intense emotion, doesn't matter, you've given it more time, more space. This is also an outcome. And over time you'll see that this does yield results. You know, when we're in the middle of a storm, we don't always trust that. But afterwards, you know, after the tears have flowed or, you know, the um, demons of the past have been seen, they don't have so much control or power over you anymore. You know, you start to realize they're actually just little fluffy bunnies and we were scared of <laughs> a paper tiger, not a real one. So we can still maintain some amount of stillness, but really what happens in daily life is that we have the opportunity to develop the other factors of the path, you know, right speech, right livelihood, right action in daily life. And um, these are so important. If there's a big kind of incongruence between your value systems and um, what you aspire to cultivate in meditation and the way you actually live your life, it's never really going to come together. This is kind of where the whole thing merges. It, it comes together and becomes integrated as our way of being, our way of showing up in the world. So we can not only integrate what we, we've known, what we've learned here, but we can also um, lay the foundation for our next meditation retreat by cultivating some of these other factors 
that we don't really get much of an opportunity to do together here. And that gives the mind an enormous amount of strength. So one question that I could pose for you to explore and to keep exploring is how can I align my life more fully with my values? How can I align my life more fully with my values? And your values may be shifting all the time, but perhaps they've changed slightly during this retreat. Perhaps you want to bring more love into your life. You want to bring maybe more boundaries, maybe more self-respect, whatever it might be. How can you bring those values, or how can you bring your life more in alignment with those? So don't throw away opportunities just because it doesn't feel like it's very spiritual, because it can become that way depending how we approach it. So I wanted to talk about virtue a little bit more, and again, talk about the positive and so-called don'ts, the do's and the don'ts, let's call it in virtue. And in the commentaries, this is known as Varita Sila, which means uh, the don'ts, <laughs> what not to do, what to restrain from. And Charita Sila, which is, charity means to go. Even now we call um, walking meditation like Chankama, which means to move, to go, to do. So this is the active form of Sila, which is often overlooked, and I think it's a very beautiful part of Sila. So, yes, we abstain from killing, but we, by doing that, we give other beings the gift of harmlessness. We protect and nurture life. The opposite of taking is giving. You know, what does it mean to give? And it doesn't only mean giving money, giving material wealth, sharing resources, but it also can mean giving our time, giving our ear to a friend. You know, giving in terms of service, which is very different from giving money. It's actually much more um, receptive to what's really needed to help a person on their path or to help a person in their life. So it's looking carefully for those opportunities to really promote life and promote the flourishing of life, not only the survival, but to help beings thrive and to help in an appropriate way, not only in the way you think somebody might want to receive, but see what they actually need. And I think by becoming more attuned with ourselves, we actually do start to resonate more in more attunement with others. You know, we start to develop our capacity to empathize. And empathy is a part of compassion. It's not something separate, but it's not in itself enough. The way that the Buddha taught compassion was to resonate, to understand, to sympathize with the suffering in the world and the difficulties people go through but not to get sunk in it with them, to rather wish for their freedom from any afflictive state, their freedom from suffering. And this is why compassion is an uplifting quality and actually is another of the Brahma Viharas because we wish people to be free from distress, to actually flourish, and we do whatever we can within our power to help with that. And then, of course, with the speech, which is a very loaded one sometimes, I wanted to go a bit more into detail with this, because speech is also a way of giving. The Buddha says that right speech is like the kind of speech that goes to the heart. It's words that are worth recording, that unite those that are divided, and that bring about harmony in this world. So speech is so powerful. And there's this little acronym that I created, I heard somebody say once that it's like we've got an axe in our mouth. We have to be so careful, you know, not to use that axe by accident. Usually it's by accident. Accident. Terrible. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, once we've said something, it's so easy to regret what we've said because we said it at the wrong time, in the wrong way. Um, without a motivation of loving kindness, without a lot of sensitivity for what that person might be going through. And it's kind of too late after that. Not totally, you know, because I tend to be very positive about things. You can always repair. But if we have a bit of restraint in the first place, a lot less damage is done. So the four kinds of speech the Buddha asked us to refrain from were false speech, malicious speech, harsh speech, and gossip. And my little acronym for that is FMHG, the four initials, 
for my higher good. <laughs> so this becomes easy to remember. For my higher good, we are restrained for for false speech, my malicious, higher harsh speech and good, gossip, useless speech. Gossip can be even worse than useless, can't it? We actually form opinions and images of people through gossiping, through listening to what other people say, that we think we're just holding in our mind, but they influence the way we respond to those people. And then we start to see those things that we expect to see. So it's very dangerous, actually, to get involved in any kind of gossip. And I think that there is a place, and certainly in monastic life there's a place, for working things out, for speaking to a trusted friend about a relationship you have with another, which is difficult perhaps, in a way that tries to understand their perspective and tries to uh, bring our own minds to a state of more charitable thought about another person. But we have to be careful who we do this with and what our motivation is. Because that person, if they're likely to fall into preferences and judgments, they might think, oh, that person really shouldn't have done that. And you're my friend. You know, we always say that, like, we have our friends and enemies. But sometimes if somebody is an enemy of our friend, they become our enemy, right? We don't like people who don't like our friends. So then it kind of extends. So we have to be very careful who we choose to confide in. And, of course, that's all about uh, wise association as well. So these are some of the lovely ways that we can use speech. You know, on the other hand, it can be gentle, it can be full of goodwill. Sometimes speech involves slowing down and just pausing before we open our mouth. I need to learn this too because my mind tends to work quite fast and it's easy for me to kind of get engaged really quickly. But sometimes if we just listen, the way we do in the group discussions here, if we can just hold space and just actually listen, a person often doesn't need our input. They can work things out and process their emotions for themselves in their own time, using their own language, simply by feeling safe, simply by feeling there's a gentle, kind presence to hear them. And they may come to their own understanding through that. And of course, if they ask us, that's different. I saw a little mem somewhere. Is that the right word? I'm very new with this social media stuff. <laughs> but it said, you know, uh, it was like this little stick being, but it made it look really emotional. And it said, I have a sad. <laughs> and then the other person said, would you like advice or would you like me to listen? And I thought that was so sweet. And they said, well, I'd like you to listen and first. And then they said, and how do you feel about this? Well, first I'd like to be angry, then I'd like to cry, and then after that I'd like us to laugh together, and then we can kind of go out and have fun. And it was just really sweet, because it's about asking a person what it is they actually need from us, rather than presuming they want our advice. And I think sometimes this is also related to speech being timely. It might not be the right time to give advice. So we can use our speech in ways that promotes benefit for others and harmony in the world. And another thing that came to mind just this morning, really, was the importance of trying to say goodbye to people, whether it's your partner at home before you go to work or somebody you haven't seen for a while and you don't know when you'll see them again. Leave them in a good way realizing that we don't know when we're going to see each other again. We just don't know. You know, every time we say goodbye could be the last time. So try not to part ways when there's an argument, or even going to bed when there's an argument between partners is supposed to be quite damaging, because that's the lingering kind of impression you get. And then you won't sleep well, you'll wake up kind of grumpy, and the whole thing will just get inflamed. So see if at all possible you can, even if you don't do it, right, but you can send a message. I get a lot of practice with this with my parents because I don't um, often see them. And when we see one another, sometimes things get more fraught, you know, because when you see each other, it's like there's an expectation and then you slip into old patterns and everybody's a bit grumpy and a bit tired. But when there's a distance, you can really express your gratitude and express 
your thanks for their support and, and just comment on some of their good qualities. This is something we don't often do. We don't give praise where it's due. And that's another aspect of right speech. I suppose there could be a whole talk just on this because this is one of the main transitions you'll be making from silence into speech. But one of the things the Buddha said is that it's actually important to blame what is blameworthy. Okay, so that's like, ooh, really? But this really means the behavior, not the person. And to be able to discern, again, wholesome from unwholesome. So we don't go around praising people who are actually immoral. You know, we can blame the behavior. We can say, actually, this behavior leads to harm. But also, we have to learn to praise what's worthy of praise. So if there's something somebody's done that is, you know, has really touched your heart, or even if it hasn't, but you could see their good intention, then we can actually tell them that. And I've noticed when I try and do this with people, maybe especially in England where people really self-deprecate a lot, they're like, oh, no, 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 instantly. You try and say something, oh, no, 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 you know, or thank you. No, thank you, thank you. And it's meant to be kind, right? It's meant to be like, but actually it prevents an energetic exchange. And for somebody trying to give thanks, if someone just says no, no, it's almost like a vroom, a pushback. And it doesn't feel pleasant for the giver and the receiver doesn't soak it in. We have a resistance to soaking it in and we need to go beyond that resistance because when someone encourages the good in us, it encourages that good to grow. So I really feel that expressing our gratitude, our love, our respect, our appreciation for one another is an important part of the path. Some people might be suspicious, what does someone want from me? But it's the sincerity with which you do it and it might take time for them to realize you're sincere but eventually it really starts to encourage a person to be their best and to live up to your respect and encouragement. So I think we can use our speech in beautiful ways. <coughs> so patience, patience is something that is a high spiritual practice. And one of these um, suttas which patience is involved in is um, the one that I already mentioned where somebody irritates us or somebody approaches us without right speech. And I'll just read it through again because I find it very beautiful. So, is it this one? Mm, okay. And again, I really encourage this book if anybody wants to get into the suttas because it has so much beautiful material on right speech and patience and resentment and personal training, wise friendship, all kinds of lovely things. So it says here that when others address us, their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm. Their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Herein you should train yourselves thus. And this is a kind of restraint. Our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness, without inner hate. We shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with that person, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable without hostility and without ill will. So this is an example of really aligning ourselves with our practice, with our values, even when others don't behave the way we expect. Because if our practice only holds up when everybody around us is kind and everything's going swimmingly well, then it's not a very deep practice and we still have work to do. Obviously it's a process. But another really nice story from the suttas is um, when there was this old Brahmin fellow called Bharadvaja. And um, this uh, Bharadvaja was a Brahmin, so he had his own religious ceremonies and the Brahmin caste were very respected, very prestigious, probably very rich. And his family all started to go to the Buddha 
and get instruction from the Buddha and some of them started to shave their head and wear these orange red robes and this Brahmin fellow thought, my goodness, what on earth is this bald-headed recluse Gautama doing to my family? <laughs> what a good for nothing. And he thought he'd better give him two cents of his mind. So he went to see the Buddha and basically started to abuse him and shout at him and say, what are you doing? You know, you're ruining the tradition. You're bringing these people away from me over to your kind of good-for-nothing recluse order or whatever he said. And uh, the Buddha just stayed present, stayed calm, and he said, Brahmin, tell me one thing. Don't you get some visitors at your house? And the Brahmin's like, what? What's that got to do with it, you stupid bald-headed recluse? <laughs> and, the <laughs> and then the Buddha said, tell me, Brahmin, if you do get some visitors at your house, don't they sometimes bring gifts? Yes, yes, they bring gifts. So what? What's this got to do with anything? And then the Buddha very patiently said, well, what happens, Brahmin, when those people bring gifts? What happens if you don't accept the gifts? Well, they remain with the giver. So what? And he said, the same thing I have to tell you. You came here bringing all your gifts. You try to offer them to me, but I don't accept your gifts. They remain with you. And then the Brahmin was probably a bit dumbstruck, but eventually kind of shook his head and walked away. So we can see other people's abuse as a gift that we simply don't need to accept. You know, they can give it, but we're not going to actually open our hands, open our hearts, open our heads, and take it in and drink it up and regurgitate it in the evening or whatever, or the next six months, we can just say, well, we don't have to actually say it, but we could, we could say, your gift belongs with you, you know, and this is really true, because what a person says about us is more of a reflection of them than it is of us. It's a reflection of their perception at that time, and a lot of the time, people make mistakes, people say things they don't really mean, and they change their mind anyway over time. So there's no point fighting with it. I think for me, I mean, in my role, I do get praise and blame. And, you know, you're standing out. You're kind of saying, come on, look at me, criticize me in a sense. And if people do have an idea of how you should be, then they'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> and if I take all of that in, then I'm going to get very confused. You know, so I have to learn to just accept that that's that person's perception. And if there's something true about it, perhaps I can have a look. Perhaps I can, um, you know, take that as valuable advice. And if not, I carry on doing what I'm doing. And over time, maybe they'll see that actually they were wrong. If they see that or not, it's not my concern. But I just have to keep on living the life that I can live with the most integrity possible. And over time, maybe they'll come around. So there's no point getting into these fights. And it's important to, number three, <laughs> I'm going over time again, but number three is harmony. And of course, all these things conduce greatly to that. And harmony is really an antidote, in a way, to living a very over-individualized life. It's thinking about the community that we're a part of, and we're all a part of a community, even if it's only our small family, but most of us also might have uh, work-related communities, extended families, friends, maybe spiritual communities. This is a community. Our monastery is a community. And communities give us the opportunity to... Practice reciprocal kindness, reciprocal generosity. And this is a really beautiful part of the path. And I wanted to share another little sutta about, uh, I think it's the six principles of cordiality that basically, the Buddha said, conduce to affection, respect, cohesiveness, non-dispute, concord and unity. So these are principles of concord and unity and um, how to live together in harmony. And they're really very simple and very beautiful too. And again, this is addressed to the monastics, but it really applies to everybody. So it says, Here a person maintains bodily acts of loving kindness towards their fellow companions, let's say, 
both openly and privately. This is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to cohesiveness, non-dispute, concord and unity. Okay, so that's the bodily acts of loving kindness, both openly and privately. So here, for example, people have been performing bodily acts of loving kindness towards you before you arrived. They, they got your rooms cleaned up. They took care about the food. They made sure everything was ready for you. You know, somebody built the place. <laughs> These are bodily acts of loving kindness that they did in private without any expectation of even who's going to come and benefit and certainly without expectation of thanks. So we do these things even on our own without people noticing. And then again, a person maintains verbal acts of loving kindness towards their fellow companions both openly and privately. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect, conduces to cohesiveness, non-dispute, concord and unity. Again, about right speech, speaking beautifully about another person, or honestly at least, maybe with an open mind, even in private, even when they don't know what you're saying. And the third one, you can imagine, is maintaining mental acts of loving kindness, both openly and privately. So that's body, mind and, and mental acts of loving kindness, publicly and privately. And then the third, next three are about giving. So here... A person shares without reservation any righteous gains that have been righteously obtained, including even the contents of one's arms bowl. So, but you can share your plate contents with another person. You can share your food. You can put the food that you didn't use in some kind of charity so that homeless people or you know, other kind of people can maybe access um, that food. Obviously, this can be thought of as well as dana, generosity, in some way. So we share these in common, and this creates affection and respect, etc. And then the next two are even more interesting. Uh, so the next one is that we uh, dwell both openly and privately, possessing in common with our fellow companions virtuous behavior that's unbroken, flawless, unblemished, unblotched, freeing, praised by the wise, ungrasped and leading to stillness. This is the beauty of virtue. That's my bit. <laughs> and lastly, perhaps the most importantly, again, one dwells both openly and privately, possessing in common with one's fellow companions a view that is noble and emancipating, which leads out for one who acts upon it to the complete destruction of suffering. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to cohesiveness, non-dispute, concord and unity. So of course this last one does particularly pertain to people living in spiritual community, but even so it hints at the importance of wise friendship on the path, people who at least have the same value system that they aspire to, even if they're not perfect in it. And um, they don't have to define themselves as Buddhist or as meditators or anything like this, but it's a view that leads to the end of suffering and that creates harmony. So if somebody's view is not leading to the end of suffering, it's creating a lot of conflict, a lot of suffering for others. Even like this idea that karma is somehow what we deserve. It's almost like a punishment and we can measure somebody else's goodness by their current situation. This is actually a view that does lead to suffering, certainly for that person and also for ourselves because it tends to give us a sense that we're very separate and different from others. So any view that leads to more compassion, more loving kindness, more letting go is a view that frees. Any view that leads to wanting to take steps on the path, taking responsibility for our lives, for our actions of body, speech and mind. This is one of the things that I feel differentiates a practitioner, someone trying to practice the path, from someone who hasn't yet maybe had the opportunity, and this is not an absolute 
But I think one thing that we're all doing, and we might be as flawed as the next person, is we're starting to take responsibility and look inside for the source of our difficulties, the source of our um, unhelpful and harmful at times behaviours. So we're starting to take that responsibility and it's really helpful, number four, to have good friendship, wise friendship on the path, to associate with people who understand that perspective. And if they don't, it's okay. I've noticed in my family that even having myself only as the only meditator there, for a while, for a long while, 20 years maybe, and only in the last eight years or so, my parents have started getting interested. Since I started bringing my teacher to England, actually, they had come to visit me in Burma because of attachment, essentially, and, and love, because they want to know I'm safe. Um, but they would never come to a monastery in Burma otherwise. <laughs> you know, and live like backpackers and sleep on the floor. And, you know, and they're very grateful for the opportunity. While they were there, they had to sit for three hours a day. That was my teacher's uh, reduction from sort of 12 hours, 14 hours. <laughs> and I was overjoyed. I kept peeking behind me and seeing them sitting there on the chest. They're still in the hall. <laughs> it was like, secretly I'd been wanting this for 20 years. Or, no, not 20 at that time. A few years, like 15 years. And, but really, it's only in the last maybe five, eight years at the most that they've started, my mother especially, coming to talks of Ajahn Brahmali, Ajahn Brahm, without me even asking. Like, they actually just say, oh, I think I'll come along. And I'm like, really? Great. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm like, great, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, if you want to. <laughs> and then once I heard my sister told me a secret. She said, well... Mum told me that she could do that every week. But she said, don't tell Chanda. <laughs> <laughs> so people don't want to be pushed. But the beautiful thing is, this has just really come to their mind as something that's maybe interesting to have a closer look at because they've seen my commitment over the years. And I think when you see that somebody's really committed and not giving up, even though they're not always happy, and she makes a point of telling me that, that I mean, don't seem very happy. <laughs> <laughs> but even then, you know, I'm not giving up. So that gives her the feeling maybe there's something there. And my dear teacher, Ajahn Brown, he actually came to stay with my parents after years of me asking him, and him sort of saying, no, I wouldn't do that. And he came and stayed two nights in my family's home, and it was so beautiful. He engaged completely with them. And my mom's showing me all her pictures of her travels. And, oh, and this place in Egypt, did it? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was playing games with my niece. And it was just so heartwarming. So over time, people get drawn in, you know. So even if you're the only one in your family that's practicing, don't worry about that. You're kind of setting an example. And even if you're not perfect, which you won't be, then you're not giving up. So this is beautiful. And um, of course, you can try to cultivate spiritual friendships too. And I'm presuming and hoping that many of you have them already. But if you are local-ish to this place, you can come back. There'll be teachers here that have been really carefully selected. I don't know if you think that I was, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, good people will be coming. And one of the things that I've been told by Laura and the other organisers here is that they always ensure that the teachers have really solid virtue. And that is a blessing. In fact, that's the main thing that you need to ask in a teacher. Um, whatever they say about their, you know, their progress or stages, hopefully they don't say too much because that's not really right, especially if they're a monastic. But um, certainly, if the seal is solid, at least as good as yours, hopefully better. And that is why you respect those teachers because you're looking towards the results of the practice, which should ensue in living a better life. So the seal should be solid. Sila is virtue. And um, certainly no kind of sexual misconduct or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that their speech will always be super skillful, because that's a much subtler aspect of the practice. But certainly look for the um, integrity, commitment, 
If they're not monastics, then obviously monastics are celibate. Otherwise, they should be not engaged in you know relationships with students, etc., etc. And it's sad that I have to say this, but it is important to say because wise friendship doesn't involve just hanging out with people who give talks, good talks. It's easy enough, not that easy, but it's you know fair, it's much easier to give a good talk than it is to live a good life, right? Because there you're really working with your inner stuff. <clears throat> so choose your teachers carefully, choose your friends carefully, and choose them for qualities they have that inspire you, that you can look up to, even if they have some weaknesses. But there's some qualities there that may be stronger than yours. You know, maybe someone's not as honest as you, but they're kinder or they're more patient, and you can really respect that. You can elevate that. You can engage with that aspect of them. Like we said about guarding the senses, you engage with what's good. And you grow that in them and also take inspiration from those friends. And the Buddha said that the reason spiritual friendship is the whole of the holy life is because um, one with good friends is expected to practice the Eightfold Path. They can be expected to do that. And that's not because they're being told to do that. That's because it will be automatic from the good friendship as a base. You'll start to see things more clearly. You'll start to have your own, um, you know, maybe not quite well-aligned views corrected or um, reflected back to you in some way. And you'll be able to have a relationship with that person that is based on loving kindness and respect, etc. So your conduct will improve as a result. And they'll hopefully be able to support you in your meditation practice too. So... Try to cultivate spiritual friendship. If you don't have a meditation group, try to find one. And um, I have two minutes to talk about how meta practice will be um, helpful in your daily life. <laughs> Before we do a little bit more meta. So, as we've been saying, you know, meta practice is a powerful method to align our practice with wise motivation. It can be a way of looking and relating to any experience that arises. So we can always have this kindfulness. Try and remember, whenever you hear teachings on mindfulness, that mindfulness alone is not enough. It should come with the three right intentions. It should be infused with the three right intentions of kindness, gentleness, and letting go. So kindfulness is a genius um, word coined by Ajahn Brahm to improve on mindfulness, which I think is necessary. And kindness is also an antidote that's embedded in the mindfulness that will work against ill will. So it's like it has an antiviral in it or something, you know, in the mindfulness. It's like wherever you shine the mindfulness and the kindness together tend to be, tends to relax, tends to settle down, it tends to overcome the ill will in the mind. So this is something we can always practice with, no matter what type of method we use. But then also, it's uh, important to try and keep your lake, the lake of your mind, large, you know, so it doesn't take on too much salt. Uh, by having some formal practice of loving-kindness, starting your meditation with loving-kindness can be a lovely way to settle the mind, to bring some joy, to, again, overcome those hindrances. And then if you want to, you can just gradually move into the quiet, into the breath, and take your samadhi practice from there. I personally think it's important to try and end every meditation with metta. We do this at our monastery at the end of uh, every group sitting. We just have a few minutes of sharing the merits. That means nothing esoteric. It means the happiness in your heart, the peace, the goodness. The motivation for your practice, the fact that you're practicing not just for you, but for many, for all beings. And just recollecting that and sharing anything mentally that you may have gained, or that you may be gaining along the path with others, with all beings. So try and end every meditation like this. It's a beautiful way to finish, and it gives you a sense that the meditation was worthwhile, no matter what arose in that session. Also in the morning, first thing, you can say some phrases of loving kindness to yourself. Last thing at night, the same. And this is why it helps you to sleep well, because if you practice loving kindness, and that's the last thought in your mind before you drift off into sleep, it's likely to 
keep orienting your mind in that direction, even in your dreams. Not always, but it's building it up bit by bit. And this eventually culminates in the end of our lives. You know, the Buddha says one with loving kindness dies happily too. And because we're training our thoughts, we're training our thoughts to be generally thoughts of loving kindness and not thoughts of ill will. So keep that lake as large as you can through the practice of loving kindness. Look at your motivation honestly, with integrity. Notice when you're going off track and just gently steer yourself back. See if you have wise friends or teachers that you can refer to to ask about your practice, anything you're not sure about. Maybe establish a sitting group. And also, practice at the right time, you know. Practice when you're really encouraged to practice. Don't practice when you have to force yourself because then meditation becomes a drag. See if you can, you know, get into the mood. Start to calm down, do some walking. Practice that sense restraint in daily life. And if you're in the mood for meditation, then you can start with loving kindness. You have to check the state of your mind as to what would be appropriate for you at any given time. And uh, somebody was asking how much to do in order to progress. It really depends on the individual, but give yourself a chance to grow into it, I would say, rather than holding the bar too high. Um, I did actually start with two hours a day, but not immediately. My intention was two hours because that was what we were conditioned to think was the minimum by my first teacher, Goenka. <coughs> and I'm quite grateful for that. But also I was in a position to do that because I didn't have a full-time job. I didn't have any responsibilities. I was a 19-year-old traveling in India. So, but even then it was very hard to do two hours a day after one retreat. So it started to dwindle. And I knew it would, so I'd booked in for my second course, and then also to serve. And it's important to give service on retreats, so don't just think that coming on meditation retreats is the practice. Serving on retreats is even more powerful, and it starts to help you integrate the two. Coming to monastery is the same. You're integrating your retreat with your daily life, with the way you relate with the people around you. So um, try to... Um, Check in with others as much as you can to get that support on the practice. And listen to talks as well online or, you know, join Dhamma groups online if you live far away. And in the end, you know, ask yourself one more question, which is what do I really want my life to be in service of? You know, what are my highest aspirations? Because in the end, you know, what are we serving here? And in a sense, the practice is all about opening the heart. It's opening the heart to one another. It's opening our hearts to our inner world so that we can actually understand what's going on and we can start to see things more in alignment with reality. So I hope that you can continue to nurture your heart because right now it can be quite sensitive, quite delicate, and to be so gentle, especially when you transit into speech. You know, be, be aware that you're a lot more sensitive than you realize. You might think you've only been here six days, you've been listening to me, so you're used to some input, but it's very different when you're energetically connecting with another person. So go very, very gently, give each other space, speak things that are true to you, that come from the heart, that are moderate, not excessive, and I just wish you really, really well on the path and in your practice, and I have to say I have absolute confidence in every one of you here. It's been an absolute privilege to be here and to share what I can with you, and just thank you for being so receptive and so compassionate in your um, receiving, because, yeah, it can be, you know, a lot to hold the responsibility of giving a retreat, and I'm always just so deeply touched by the kindness in which it's received. And I think that's just a sign of your genuine integrity and sincerity in the practice. You know, it's like, we're all like sponges. So take in the good, keep on soaking it in. Anything that's been said here <coughs> that hasn't resonated, that's confused you, leave it aside, just drop it. If it makes sense later, fine, you'll remember it. <clears throat> if not, it doesn't matter. Just take whatever works for you and leave the rest aside. And from my side, 
I would also like to ask forgiveness for anything that I've said or done or intended that's caused anybody any harm. And uh, from my side to you, you're all forgiven completely <laughs> because you are just as you are and you couldn't be any other way. So, And there's been no harm done, only goodness shared. So thank you all very, very much. do have some time to flow into our final meta practice. <laughs> I know, I'm also busting for the loo. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's already 9.37. I think I can hang on. Luckily, I've been blessed by a big bladder. <laughs> so far. <laughs> sure you didn't want to know that. But. <laughs> So while we uh, wait for others to also come back in, this is a beautiful opportunity to just let the words settle, the kindness that we've all shared together, nourish our hearts and to land gently, softly, kindly in our bodies, making any adjustment that you can. I'm actually encouraging you here to make adjustments because this shows your body and gives your body the confidence that you really care. Feeling the ground. Sensing that you're held by the ground, the earth beneath you and by the beautiful holding field of loving kindness that we share. Appreciating the silence that's still going to be there for you whenever you care to remember her, turn towards her in your life, in your practice, between the thoughts, the silence that surrounds. Giving the mind a chance to rest and to move into that feeling world, your emotional, intuitive world inside. And perhaps beginning again by reflecting on your own goodness, anything that you see inside Maybe now, maybe some quality that's arisen, maybe inspiration, a sense of satisfaction that you've completed the retreat, or anything that you generally notice or that others notice in you, that you can really feel a sense of respect and gladness toward. Regarding yourself with kindly eyes, holding yourself in the loving gaze of friendliness. You are someone's dear friend.
and connecting gently with any feelings of well-being that arise. Just bringing to mind a loved person once again, maybe someone you've been practicing with and have had success in generating loving kindness towards. Getting a sense of this person doesn't have to be a clear image, but just a sense of who they are, their qualities or their presence, maybe their face, whatever helps you bring them to mind. And sending them your loving kindness in whatever way works for you. And you see this person or sense them starting to relax, starting to smile. Perhaps you sense the warmth in your heart. Doesn't matter what you feel, just that intention is enough. Now we're going to allow any feelings of loving kindness to spread, still including this loved person, but to spread to everyone here in this room, all your companion meditators, your spiritual friends for these last six days, who've been living together in harmony. committed to this practice, bringing all their heart, all their energy to this space. May we all be happy and peaceful. May we be liberated. May we be free. Imagining this beautiful loving kindness spreading into the room, enveloping, suffusing each and everyone here, including those who may have left the hall. As though golden sunshine were emanating from everyone's chest, from everyone's body, filling up this space like sunlight streaming in through the windows, bringing with it a sense of peace. Just allowing this loving kindness to flow, to fill up this room. Relaxing your body more fully, more deeply too.
Wishing everyone well in their journey on, their next steps, may they be safe. May we all continue to cultivate the seeds of loving kindness, wisdom, stillness, virtue, the whole of the Eightfold Path. May we all grow in Dhamma. May our hearts be truly free. And imagining this loving kindness now, or maybe even sensing it becoming stronger and stronger, so it no longer can be contained. And it starts seeping out through the windows, the door, beyond this room into the whole of Cloud Mountain Retreat Center, to all the staff, the volunteers, the neighbors flowing down the road, along the highways through the skies, to all the neighboring towns and cities. Perhaps the whole of Washington State, where many of you may have family, loved ones, where there are people who are happy, people who are sick or unwell, sad, lonely. May all beings in this whole state share our loving kindness. Like a beautiful golden glow coming across everybody, the sunshine shining on each living being or maybe like a beautiful, peaceful blanket enveloping all beings and keeping them safe and just allowing now this metta to spread in every direction across the whole of the United States perhaps to family or friends further afield, and those you don't know. Those who think like you and share your values, those who have different beliefs and views. This whole diverse country with so much good being done and also much harm. May all beings find inner peace. Live virtuous, happy lives. May all beings be well, be safe, be liberated. Including all animals all insects and birds, fish, turtles, lizards, and great mighty animals too, like the bears or those cats, which I forget the name of, that wander around here. All beings in the whole of the United States and South America too, right across the oceans, up into Canada and across the Pacific, the Atlantic, spreading this loving kindness throughout this whole planet Earth to the countries that you've been to, that you've visited or know people there. And to those places that you've never been. Places that may be at war. 
where so many beings are suffering in fear for their lives. Places of famine and hunger. Places affected by the climate catastrophe. And all those beings who are well, wherever they are, those beings who are good-hearted and those beings who are lost, may all beings in this whole planet Earth, human beings and non-human beings, may they all be at peace. May they all benefit from our combined loving-kindness and sense that nobody wishes them harm. May all beings lay down their weapons, lay aside their conflict and find peace. Imagining this beautiful loving kindness lighting up the whole planet Earth with a golden glow, or maybe a white veil of peace covering this whole planet Earth, healing the hurt in human hearts, healing the planet Earth herself. And allowing this loving kindness just to spread even beyond this planet Earth as far as it will to wherever there may be life. Outwards and unbounded. Without hostility, without ill will. This pure benevolent loving kindness just flowing freely. As far as it will. As you just rest in the beautiful feeling, intention, boundless nature of loving kindness for a while. Giving and receiving, merging into one. now very gently start to bring your energy back into this space, into the room, but leaving the warmth and the peace outside, allowing it to continue resting on this planet Earth and all living beings. And just gently becoming aware again of your body. of this being that you know as you. The one you know most intimately in this life. Aware of your so-called faults and strengths. Aware 
of your own happiness and sadness, your anxiety, your struggles and your strength. And just gently allow this loving kindness to soak you right through, spreading to all parts of your body. To heal any pain. And if you notice any little part of yourself that you've left outside, imagine that little part looking back at you as if to say, will you take me in too? And gently stretch out your hand and welcome that part back inside. This part too needs your love. This part too belongs, belongs to you. May I forgive myself for whatever I might have done or experienced that's hurt or harmed me in any way. May I offer myself the gift of forgiveness or the intention to forgive anything that I may have done that's hurt or harmed another, knowingly or unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally. I offer myself complete forgiveness. knowing that everyone makes mistakes. And if anyone has hurt or harmed me intentionally or unintentionally, I offer to them now my intention to forgive. If there's forgiveness in my heart, I offer it now freely, unconditionally, to whatever extent I can. And if not, I offer the intention to find that forgiveness, allow that forgiveness to grow in its own time. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free. May I be happy. May I be free. So I'm going to end by chanting you a blessing and you can just soak it in. Just relax and allow the words and the energy of loving kindness to go where it will. Sabe Sata Sabe Pana Sabe Buddha Sabe Pogala Sabe Atta Bawa Pariapana Saba Etio Sabe Purisa 
Sabe Ariha Sabe Anaviha Sabe Deva Sabe Manusa Sabe Abia Paja Hontu Aniga Hontu Sukiatanam Pavi Harantu Duka Munjantu Yadalada Sampatito Sad. Only one left. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> Thank you so much for your practice, and I wish you all well, safe journey, happy life, contented easily satisfied mm -hmm. and please uh, emerge gently and enjoy the chai mm -hmm. and that is one thing that will bring me to the kitchen too <laughs> because I like chai and so maybe I'll see you there. <laughs>